Just a week after the violent explosion that tore apart Ship 36 and shattered the Massey's test site, SpaceX is already racing to recover. From diagnosing a failure that never should have happened to rebuilding a test site scorched by fire and shrapnel, SpaceX is treating this disaster as fuel for evolution. To quickly recap, the explosion occurred during a full-duration static fire preparation for Flight 10. The initial investigations suggest the explosion originated in the Payload Bay region, likely caused by a failure of a nitrogen COPV or composite overwrap pressure vessel housed within the vehicle. Preliminary data indicates that the COPV failed at a pressure below its proof pressure, a threshold it was theoretically designed to survive without issue. This is an extremely rare and alarming failure mode, suggesting either a critical manufacturing defect, undetected damage, or an unforeseen structural vulnerability. The torn COPV fragments scattered around the site, including one showing exposed fiber shreds and a ruptured liner, make it clear this wasn't a gradual leak or thermal breach. It was a violent, internal burst event. Such a failure could instantly sever transfer tubes near the header tank area, releasing cryogenic methane in an uncontrolled manner. Combined with an oxygen-rich environment and potential ignition sources in the avionics or electrical systems, this would cause rapid pressurization and combustion, leading to a cascading structural failure. The resulting explosion destroyed the vehicle entirely and caused widespread secondary damage at the test site. SpaceX is now engaged in a detailed investigation to validate these initial findings, explore alternative root causes, and identify necessary corrective actions. This includes re-evaluating COPV manufacturing protocols, improving quality control, and stress testing new safety designs. Engineering teams are likely conducting hydrostatic burst tests on identical COPV units to check for systematic flaws, and re-evaluating the layout of the header tank plumbing and payload bay for impact tolerance. Meanwhile, SpaceX is moving forward with Ship 37, currently inside Megabay 2, where engine installation is already underway. In parallel with hardware integration, engineers will implement all corrective measures based on Ship 36's failure analysis. Once design confidence is restored, Ship 37 will proceed to its own static fire campaign. However, for Ship 37 to undergo a static fire test, the Massey's test site must be restored to operational status, which currently bears the scars of the catastrophic test failure. Aerial footage captured by the Interstellar Gateway reveals the full extent of the damage. The static fire test stand has been nearly obliterated. Only its four main support legs and the top circular ring remain. All other structural elements, including the hydraulic hold-down clamps, pneumatic actuators, and cable trays, have been destroyed. The gantry structure that housed the ship quick disconnect arm and contained the propellant feed lines was also completely wiped out. This assembly, which is critical for fueling and commanding the ship, will need to be built entirely from scratch. Ship debris is strewn across the site. Large fragments of the main vehicle, including the nose cone, common dome, header tanks, and sections of the downcomer, have been found both around the test pad and even in the nearby river. Shredded Raptor engine components are scattered throughout the debris field, and COPV fragments show how violently the pressure vessels failed. The structural separation of these components confirms that the explosion began in the upper region and violently tore through the fuselage. The flame trench beneath the test stand shows mixed results. Debris can be seen piled over the water-cooled deflector system. However, structurally, the trench walls and floor remain intact. There are no major fractures or blowouts in the trench lining, which implies that only minor resurfacing and debris removal may be necessary here. Another fortunate outcome is that the nearby propellant storage tanks were not breached despite being charred by the blast. Had these tanks ruptured under shock, the methane and liquid oxygen inside could have caused a secondary explosion far more devastating than the initial blast. The deluge water tanks, which sit near the trench and are crucial for pad cooling, also appear burned but structurally unharmed. Some supporting equipment was not so lucky. Heat exchangers, critical for managing cryogenic propellant flow, were destroyed and will need replacement. The transfer pipes, pumps, and valves connecting the storage tanks to the test stand were completely obliterated. This infrastructure failure allowed uncontained methane to leak, fueling the flames that burned across the site for hours. Additionally, instrument shelters and temporary tents were burned, likely destroying sensitive telemetry and control equipment. On the brighter side, the new booster test stand under construction nearby appears undamaged. Also, the Block 3 Pathfinder test tank, Tank 17, housed within the structural test rig, shows no signs of impairment and remains ready for future testing. Rebuilding Massey's will be no small feat, but SpaceX has already begun the cleanup process. 
Cranes and heavy equipment have been spotted clearing debris, and once the site is cleaned, reconstruction will begin immediately. As workers currently assigned to Pad B and the orbital tank farm expansion can be reassigned to Massey's, it could be ready to host Starship pre-launch tests in two to three months. The recurring failures in Block 2 Starship vehicles are beginning to cast doubt on the long-term viability of this design iteration. Flight 7 and Flight 8 both ended in mid-air disasters, and Flight 9 Ship 35 experienced engine issues during static fire testing and ultimately failed to perform a controlled atmospheric re-entry. And now, Ship 36's ground-based explosion, before even reaching full engine ignition, has amplified concern that deeper systemic issues may be embedded in Block 2. With just ships 37 and 38 remaining in this block, SpaceX faces a critical decision, continue test flights with these remaining units, or pivot entirely to the next generation Block 3 ships. On one hand, skipping the remaining Block 2 vehicles would mean writing off significant investments in hardware, including those two already stacked ships, boosters 15 through 17, which are compatible only with Block 2 ships, and over 100 flight-ready Raptor 2 engines that are either already installed or allocated for these specific vehicles. It also means SpaceX would have to fast-track Ship 39, the first Block 3 variant, which hasn't yet begun stacking. However, continuing with Block 2 requires rebuilding Massey's for just two more vehicles, and then again reworking it shortly after to support Block 3 hardware and test configurations. This introduces double the engineering workload, additional downtime, and a narrow window for meaningful gain. By contrast, rebuilding Massey's now to directly accommodate Block 3 could streamline infrastructure and save months in the overall schedule. Also, Pad A at Starbase can't support Block 3 launches due to structural incompatibility with the new Starship and booster design. If SpaceX skips directly to Block 3, Pad A will become obsolete. However, this would also open the door to begin immediate demolition and reconstruction of Pad A potentially converting it into a Pad B-style mount with a flame trench and enhanced infrastructure. Doing this now accelerates the timeline for having two fully compatible launch pads operational by early next year. Overall, skipping to Block 3 ships depends on multiple parallel threads aligning. Massey's must be rebuilt and reconfigured for Block 3 testing, Ship 39 needs to be fully stacked and integrated, and Raptor 3 engines must complete qualification at McGregor and be delivered on schedule. Most critically, the Block 3 launch timeline depends on the readiness of Pad B, which is already nearing structural completion. Remaining tasks include installing the ship and booster quick disconnects, finishing tank farm upgrades, integrating support systems, and validating the pad through full systems testing. If SpaceX can pull these elements together, then skipping Block 2 could pay off in higher launch cadence across this year. But if delays arise in any of these areas, flying ships 37 and 38 may serve as a strategic buffer buying SpaceX valuable time to finalize Block 3 readiness without stalling momentum. In a surprising development, a brand new flame diverter top ridge, nearly identical to the one installed at Pad B, was recently spotted at Starbase. This is the critical structure that absorbs the direct blast of engine exhaust before channeling it down into the flame trench. It also integrates the main inlet from the deluge system, distributing high-pressure water through internal ducts in both flame buckets to suppress acoustic energy and mitigate thermal shock during ignition. It's unclear if it is destined for the Starship launch pad under construction at Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A, or if it's the first visible component of a brand new flame trench system being prepared for the future Pad A rebuild. What do you think? Has Starship Block 2 reached its end? Or will they squeeze out two more flights to gather more data before taking the leap let us know in the comments. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. The Axiom Mission 4 to the International Space Station has finally lifted off on early Wednesday morning after weeks of delays. Let's take a closer look at what caused the repeated delays and then break down the key details of the mission. Organized by Houston-based Axiom Space, AX-4 is the fourth in a series of commercial crewed flights to the ISS, launched aboard SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. The mission is commanded by Peggy Whitson, former NASA astronaut and Axiom's director of human spaceflight, who holds the U.S. record for longest cumulative time in space. She's joined by Group Captain Shub Hanshu Shu Claw of the Indian Air Force, who serves as pilot. Shu Claw is currently training under ISRO's Gaganyaan program and is poised to become the first Indian astronaut to visit the ISS and the second Indian in space since Rakesh Sharma's 1984 mission to Salyut 7.
The rest of the crew includes mission specialists Sawa Szyznanski, a Polish engineer representing ESA in CERN, and Tiber Kapu, a Hungarian mechanical engineer taking part in Hungary's first astronaut mission since the Soviet era. AXE-4 was initially scheduled for launch on June 11 from Kennedy Space Center, but on June 8, a post-static fire check revealed a liquid oxygen leak in Falcon 9's first stage plumbing, a serious risk under cryogenic conditions due to potential fire hazards or unstable propellant flow. SpaceX postponed the launch after detecting the leak, prompting immediate repair efforts. Around this time, engineers identified a separate issue, an anomaly in the thrust vector control system on one of the booster engines. They promptly replaced the affected hardware to ensure vehicle stability. With all issues addressed, a wet dress rehearsal was successfully completed on June 13, confirming launch readiness. However, as Falcon 9 issues were being resolved, a separate problem arose aboard the ISS. On June 12, NASA reported a critical pressure drop in the Russian's Vesta module, traced to a leak in the aft transfer tunnel connecting it to the main station body. Since the leak was observed, crew members aboard the station sealed likely leak points and stabilized the internal pressure, though the underlying structural issue is still being closely monitored. This wasn't a new concern, the leak in that section has been tracked since 2019. While the exact cause is still unknown, leading theories include thermal fatigue and stress-induced microcracks, common failure modes in aging, pressurized modules like Zvezda, which has been operating for over two decades. These recurring leaks have reignited debate about the ISS's longevity, with Elon Musk suggesting retirement within two years, well ahead of NASA's 2030 target. With Falcon 9 cleared for flight, and the leak contained, AX-4 lifted off on June 25 from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. The launch marks a key milestone for Axiom Space, which continues to lead private crewed missions to low Earth orbit. For this flight, SpaceX used a brand new Crew Dragon capsule named Grace, now the fifth active spacecraft in its Dragon fleet. About nine and a half minutes after liftoff, the capsule successfully separated from Falcon 9's upper stage and began its 28-hour journey to the ISS. The spacecraft is scheduled to dock with the station at 11 a.m. GMT on June 26. After standard pressurization and safety checks, the AX-4 astronauts will board the station, where they'll be greeted by the current ISS crew of seven international astronauts. The AX-4 crew will spend roughly two weeks aboard the ISS, conducting 60 experiments, the highest number for any Axiom mission to date. These studies will focus on microgravity's impact on human physiology, microbial resistance, and crop resilience. The mission is expected to conclude in the second week of July, when the crew will undock and return to Earth aboard their Crew Dragon capsule. Amazon's ambitious Project Kuiper marked a key milestone on June 23rd with the successful launch of its second operational batch of broadband satellites. The launch was carried out by a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket, which lifted off from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. Following a smooth ascent, the rocket executed its flight profile precisely. The five solid rocket boosters separated cleanly, followed by the jettisoning of the 5-meter payload fairing once atmospheric drag was negligible. After main engine cutoff, the first stage detached, and the Centaur upper stage ignited to deliver the satellites into orbit. A little over an hour after liftoff, all 27 Kuiper satellites were sequentially deployed into a 450 km parking orbit. They will complete initial checkouts in this orbit before maneuvering to their final 630 km orbit at a 52 degrees inclination. With this Kuiper 2 mission, Amazon has now deployed a total of 56 satellites, including two technology demonstrators launched in 2023. First announced in 2019, Project Kuiper aims to deliver fast, affordable internet to underserved and remote regions around the world. The initiative envisions a constellation of 3,236 satellites distributed across 98 orbital planes at altitudes between 590 and 630 kilometers. Each satellite is equipped with several advanced technologies including KA-band phased array antennas, optical intersatellite links using infrared lasers, and electric propulsion systems for precise orbital maneuvers. Amazon aims to deliver broadband speeds up to 400 Mbps initially, with the potential to reach 1 Gbps as the network matures. The first customer-facing services are expected to begin later in 2025. Amazon enters a market already dominated by Starlink which has launched over 9,000 satellites and serves about 5 million users. Most Starlink satellites orbit at altitudes near 550 kilometers, 
giving them natural advantages in terms of lower signal latency and reduced free space path loss, both of which scale with distance. In contrast, Kuiper's higher operational altitude, though helpful for wider ground coverage and longer satellite visibility windows, may cause 30% more signal loss at similar frequencies, potentially affecting throughput and latency. To overcome this, Amazon may need to rely on more powerful user terminals, smarter signal processing, or tighter satellite spacing. Technically, Starlink currently leads in terms of satellite count, global coverage, and proven performance. However, Kuiper's advanced hardware and integration with Amazon Web Services, enabling edge computing, content delivery, and intelligent routing, give it strong competitive potential. To support rapid deployment, Amazon has secured over 80 launch contracts with ULA, Blue Origin, Ariane Space, and notably, with SpaceX, despite being Kuiper's chief competitor. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, so you never miss an episode.